Today, we have a bonus episode for you, but it does not have to do with compressors. V Guru promises he'll have another compressor episode up very soon. Welcome back to The Compressor Guru. Today, we have a different kind of episode. Uh, it's the first kind of episode like this. We have a guest with us that wrote a book about something that's near and dear to my heart. And that's the Constitution of the United States, but it's more specific than that. And specific is not an ocean. That's a Pacific. Specific than that, it's about the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment guarantees Americans the right to keep and bear arms in case of a tyrannical government. I'm sure Ken can quote it perfectly, uh, but that's beside the point. We're going to get to that. I'd like to introduce Ken to the viewing audience. This is Ken Bumgarten, and he's a very interesting guy, and he's had a variety of life experiences, and we're not going to dwell into all of those today, but we are going to talk about his book. Uh, you want to tell us about your book? Sure. A couple of years ago, I decided to sit down and write down some thoughts about the Second Amendment, and particularly about this uh, never-ending debate in America regarding the Second Amendment. And an interesting thing, when I published the book, I got a lot of comments on the internet saying, there is no debate. What part of shall not be infringed don't you understand? I said, well, if you just look at the, pol the politicians in the world, they think there's a debate. And if you're not going to participate in that, that's up to you. But for you to just sit back and pretend that there's not an onslaught against your civil rights that are guaranteed in the Second Amendment is naive and dishonest with yourself, no less with others. So I decided to do a little writing there so that uh, those who aren't clear on whether or not there's a debate uh, may become better equipped to participate. Excellent. Um, I know this isn't your first book. We'll touch on those later. But uh, you, while we were talking off camera, you used the word verbose. Yes, sir. And verbose is what? Verbose means you like to talk a lot. Okay. And so when I was a kid, uh, my dad bought a rowboat, and he decided to name it after me. And I still have that rowboat. And really? The name of the boat is the Breezy. <laughs> and he said because Breezy was kinder than windbag. <laughs> I like it. So, um, well, Now, you published this in 2019? Yes. What's changed since 2019 with the book or with the debate? Sure. Well, the biggest thing that's changed is for the first time in history, we have someone in the White House who has multiple times, as a senator, as the vice president, and as the president, uh, spoken about using the United States military against its own citizens. When he hears people talk about the Second Amendment, he says, if you are going to rise up against a tyrannical government, you, you're going to need to have nukes and F-15s. So that's one of the biggest changes. There's a man in the White House who's the commander-in-chief who is comfortable with at least the notion of utilizing the U.S. military against you. You're a veteran. Yes, sir. When you joined the Army, mm -hmm. you took an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States. Yes. Do you? I I know what you're like. You have read the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Is there anything in the Constitution saying that the president cannot order this? Unfortunately, <laughs> there isn't. So there 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 is a thing called posse comitatus, which is not in the Constitution. It's oh, actually, a, I thought that was. It's a legal principle that says that the military can't be employed as, say, a police force within the within the U.S. But um, but as the commander-in-chief, he can issue the order, like most things, like forgiving student loan debt, like uh, other executive actions. By the time you get around to these things being nullified through the court system, it's too late. The thing has already happened. Right. So if he issues such an order, it's, it's fine for us to think that he doesn't have the authority, but that'll be of small solace to somebody who's lost their life or their liberty while the courts take multiple years to sort it out. One thing I am pleased about, this is off the subject of your book, but the Supreme Court is taking up the uh, student loan 
yes. thing yes, right as now. We and they, they, that went there promptly. Yes. Um, so, yeah, we have a... I'm choosing my words kindly. We have a... We have a president that is challenged with reality. And with that challenge, I am very scared for our country. Hmm. Well, if I could touch on that for a second. Recently, he signed a piece of legislation that related to guns. And at the signing ceremony, he said, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember the quote exactly, but he said, this legislation will save lives, God willing. And I immediately thought to myself, well, is this legislation or is this a prayer? Because if you understood logically and rationally how this would affect gun crime, you would simply say, this legislation will save lives. But when you add God willing to it, it tells me that you are throwing something at the wall in the hopes that it will somehow affect gun crime. When in reality, what we all know is, is that people who commit crimes of any sort don't care very much about what the president signed or didn't sign. That's paper, and that doesn't affect the way they live their lives. So when he said that, this will save lives, God willing, I thought to myself, even he knows uh, in his uh, arguably diminished capacity that these laws are a hope, they're a wish, they're a prayer. They're not tied directly to any practical outcomes. Well stated. Thank you. See why we have them on? Okay, let me ask you. What? There's a couple things since 2019 that have happened. Uh, basically, what's changed in the landscape and or how has the pandemic, which I hate the word pandemic because mm -hmm. we didn't have a true pandemic in the truest definition. Mm -hmm. How has the pandemic or the landscape changed things or affected things with the Second Amendment? Sure. I think it's done a couple things for, for the cause of the Second Amendment and for our society as a whole. It opened up a lot of people's eyes to a few different things. Um, human beings are very intelligent creatures as individuals and even in small collaborative groups. In, big groups were stupid. In great big numbers, we are very stupid. And uh, we're also prone to panic. So I want you to think about what happened shortly after this thing hit us. Um, we were told that there was an upper respiratory virus and people flooded the markets and bought all the toilet paper. So there's, there's no rational connection between upper respiratory virus and toilet paper. Okay, so we are panicky creatures. If the pandemic taught you nothing else, it should have taught you we are panicky creatures. The second thing it showed us is that some people really, really like making other people do things or stopping other people from doing things. And if you get the cover of an emergency, to embolden them, they will just go hog wild. So what does this do for us for the Second Amendment? I hope it taught everyone that with just a little bit of a hint in the air of trouble, some people will oppress other people. They'll tell you to do crazy things, like have uh, painters tape arrows on the aisle floor in the grocery store. That'll stop it. To create a one-way <laughs> virus. So it's... If you go the wrong way down the one-way aisle, you're going to get sick. If you go the right way, you're going to be safe. We are irrational beings prone to panic. So what would happen if it wasn't toilet paper? What would happen if it was the beans and the bread and the milk and the chicken and the hamburger? Then all of a sudden, the stakes change. And you have to understand, there's nobody coming for you. You are on your own. Our own. Um, you know, you, you just touched on something about some people are very comfortable getting other people to do and not do other things. Yes, sir. Uh, I know with how well read you are, 1984, an animal farm come to mind. Mm -hmm. And, uh, for those readers out there, 1984, an animal farm are books by, his name just dropped out of my mind. George Orwell. George Orwell. And... They were written in the 50s, I believe. Yes. And I know 1984 is available on YouTube uh, as a free movie right now. 
and watch it and see if it doesn't send some shivers down your spine thinking about some of the things we've seen in the last few years. Yeah. Most specifically in 1984 there's the idea of the memory hole and uh, when, in, when information becomes inconvenient it goes down the memory hole. And so one of the things that we see in the landscape regarding the Second Amendment is uh, an event will take place, it'll be a terrible event, it'll be a tragedy, it'll be a, a horrific crime, and it'll be emphasized to the nth degree. Then there'll be a very similar event that takes place, only um, there are some demographic qualities about the perpetrator that are inconvenient, and that very similar event will get memory hold, it gets disappeared. We don't want to talk about that because it doesn't support the narrative. We want to focus on the one that supports the narrative. And that's a big part of what we've seen with the pandemic, is that the narrative is uber alles. The narrative is overall. We have to make sure that no matter what uh, contravening evidence comes our way, we stick to the narrative and get people to, com to uh, conform to the dictates of the narrative and not to what they see with their lying eyes. So we could go down a bunch of rabbit holes talking about some of the things that have happened. You're talking about the memory hole. Uh, the one thing that just terrified me was this truth committee or truth commission that uh, the president wanted to set up. And that just, I'm like, holy crap, we're there. Uh, they're, we're there in a bad way. Um, so what's gotten better? Sure, and, and it's kind of related to that. You'll notice that when they promoted this uh, misinformation committee or whatever they were calling it, it was quite an Orwellian title. Yes. Um, when they promoted that, there was a massive backlash. And that brings us to one of the things that's really gotten better. This is going to sound contraintuitive. The um, polls are showing that public trust in mainstream media is at an all-time low. Um, Congress has the lowest trust rating that it's ever had. People understand that they are not being told the truth. So, uh, so that's a great thing because when someone comes along and says, uh, the Second Amendment is, is nobody wants to take away your shotgun to keep you from hunting rabbits. Well, it was never about hunting rabbits, Joe. So there's no reason for us to think that. And enough people have enough distrust now that when they hear people say ludicrous things and make ridiculous claims, they don't just accept it. There was a time when if Walter Cronkite told you that the war in Vietnam was lost, you just simply accepted that without looking into any details. But that's not the case anymore uh, once the panic subsides. So when the panic is hot, People say, okay, I didn't go to World War II and I didn't go to Vietnam, but I'm going to war against COVID, so I'm going to put on my uniform, and I'm going to put on my helmet, get that shield down, put on some rubber gloves, and I'm ready to go get some more toilet paper. Right? So, down the one-way aisle. Down the one-way aisle. So they, they were ready to buy in, but as time went on, and they couldn't ignore what they could see with their own eyes anymore, they started to say, okay, everything must be taken with a grain of salt. Everything must be verified. Just because someone with a title behind their name makes a claim doesn't make it so. I need to get this information verified for myself before I just go along with it. That's one of the best things that's happened. If there can be a positive outcome to people lying as a matter of course, it's that a lot of people come to understand that if their lips are moving, there's a good chance they're lying. Well, that I would put it a little bit more gently than that, mm -hmm. in respect that we've learned some critical thinking. That yes. you know, your common sense. You were born with some common sense, and you learned some common sense. You know, you've over the past several years, you've been stung so many times. You figured out you've been lied to. One week the masks don't work. Next week you got a triple mask. And then the ne next week, oh, I like double mask. Oh, wait, the mask didn't work. Mm -hmm. So through the experience of being lied to, we have Americans are developing some common sense. Yes. Unfortunately, <clears throat> it's, it's done that to a great extent. 
But the other thing that it's done is it's solidified the division. So the masks are now a symbol of which team you're on. Yeah. And so if you're, there's a good chance, I'm going to say something terrible right now. Just give you a heads up that I'm about to say something. Are you something going to terrible. have to be change the rating for non controversial? There's a good chance. Okay. When I see someone with a mask, a little part of me these days, particularly after the Cochrane Library meta analysis of 78 studies, shows that it had no effect on uh, preventing transmission. When I see that, a little part of me hopes that the person has some kind of an uh, immune system compromise and isn't just crazy. Because I don't want to think that my fellow citizens are out here putting this thing on to signal that they're morally superior. I'd rather think that you're protecting yourself for a legitimate reason than to think that you're just advertising your superiority. Well, we've been working on moral superiority through for decades in this country yes. by wearing a red ribbon or a yellow ribbon or a blue yes. ribbon or... As Rush Limbaugh showed you how to fold a dollar so that you were concerned about the deficit. Yeah. You know, we've been working on being morally superior by putting things on for decades. Yes. yes. Well, they're not ribbons here anymore. They're ribbons here. Right. And one of the challenges is if you keep telling people how different they are, they'll believe you. And so the division is reinforced by all of the different sort of totems and labels and, and things that we're doing. And so... As a, as a part of the problem, so it's a good thing that people are becoming more skeptical, but a bad thing is we're dividing more deeply into teams, and you're more likely to accept the whole slate of beliefs of your team and reject the whole slate of beliefs of the other team. And that leaves us in a position where we can't make rational arguments and have reasonable conversations with each other. It is becoming more and more difficult to sit down with somebody that's of another political strife and have a conversation. Yes. Quite frankly, I, I, I won't even go there. My camera wife's going, don't even go there. But it's, it's getting more difficult to have a rational conversation. And yes. the, the, the point of a conversation isn't to, if you have a disagreement, it isn't to win or lose. It is to come to an understanding, maybe a compromise. But it, it's progress is the point. Right. And I don't know everything. I'll never know. Wait, everything. wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Could you say that again? I don't wait. know everything. Really? That, I, that's going to come back to bite you. Wow. <laughs> Bud's rule number four is never stop learning. And if I never stop learning, I still won't know everything. You want to hear my other rules? Tune in again. I'll give them to you. Uh, <laughs> so, um, Okay, so what's the most significant or dangerous threat to gun ownership or the Second Amendment today? I think it, this is going to sound weird. The short answer is conflation. And uh, what I mean by that is merging everything gun-related into one pile. Okay, so uh, when, uh, when someone who has a, uh, a decades-long criminal history commits a crime with a gun and... Uh, they were, they've been prohibited for decades from owning a gun because of their criminal background. Uh, everyone who's ever thought about owning a gun gets lumped together in the same pool. That's what I mean by conflation. How is that happening? Why is that happening? Um, another C word, consolidation. The media is becoming more and more consolidated into the hands of a handful of large corporations. Uh, I'm going to use an example from real life. When the uh, Kyle Rittenhouse situation unfolded and he went to trial, you could hear the exact same words come out of mouths of reporters all around the country on all different channels because they clearly received a fax or an email and the same words were spoken. Uh, tr illegally transported a gun across state lines. His mom drove him with that rifle across state lines. Uh, not allowed to possess a gun because he's a minor. All these things were untrue. These were easily verifiable untruths. But they got repeated like by, as if by parrots across the entire media spectrum because of this consolidation of media 
this unified narrative that gets put out there, and that becomes much more difficult for you to have a community, have a conversation with someone when all the information that they know is wrong, is false, because they got it from this mainstream source that is spreading one narrative. It doesn't matter if the narrative is helpful or a hindrance. What matters is, is it true? And they could have known if it was true by simply Googling the, uh, the Wisconsin laws regarding possession of a firearm by a 17-year-old, et cetera, et cetera. But they're not interested in that. They're interested in the narrative. Makes me, I'm a student of history, and this makes me think of uh, Goebbels during the Second World War. You can tell a giant lie, tell it often enough, and people will believe it. Mm -hmm. And it's like the mainstream media have that fax machine or email now, and they just troll it out there, and all the little good good soldiers repeat it until you know they're they're trying to get the majority of people to go to. Oh, that must be true. I heard it on CBS, NBC, and that other network that starts with a C. Well, let's talk about how pervasive that power is. Uh, after the Rittenhouse verdict, so he's found as a matter of fact and as a matter of law as not guilty, uh, so, which means the three people that he shot were the criminals and he was the victim. I saw a law enforcement officer in an interview refer to one of the men that he shot as a victim of Kyle Rittenhouse. Well, Kyle Rittenhouse has no victims. He was found not guilty by virtue of self-defense, and the men who attacked him were committing uh, assault and battery up to and including attempted murder. He was the victim. But even a law enforcement officer who should know better has heard that narrative so many times that he either unwittingly or was a, a witting uh, tool of the media stood there and referred to a guy who was trying to kill a 17-year-old by hitting him in the head with a skateboard as the victim. Yeah. That's not the victim. No. Like and subscribe. And hit the notification button so you can come back to hear episodes 2 and 3 of The Guru Interviewing Ken Baumgarten. In these bonus episodes, we're going to continue to discuss Ken's book, arguing about guns. Have a great day and God bless you all.